Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Dachau was built in 1933 in Northwest of Munich, Germany as the first Nazi concentration camp. And it was the model that all other camps were made after. It also served as an SS concentration guard camp training center. Over 200,000 prisoners were held there until the survivors were liberated by the Americans in April 1945. Hitler committed suicide the very next day. From July 1945 to 1948, the US military used Dachau to intern Nazi party officials and SS members for the Dachau trials, where they were held accountable for their atrocities. During World War II, escapes were rare but some succeeded. Susan Slonim's survey is father, Max Mueller, a Jew and former Third Reich official, saved his family but risked his own life by choosing to go to Dachau on a rescue mission. Kathy Mueller Slonim, who passed away in 2021, documented her family story and her daughter, Susan, is here to carry the legacy forward. Please welcome Susan Slonim Survey. Thank you so much, Debbie, for having me on. I'm really so interested in talking about my mom's memoir. I would like to start by just mentioning that the Jews in the Germanic lands were very loyal and committed part of the German society. They were not only doctors and lawyers and engineers and architects, but they were business leaders, musicians, artists, scientists. They were very involved in the society. My grandfather fought for Germany in World War I, and my grandmother and her sisters volunteered for the German Red Cross during World War I. And this is one of the reasons why when many Jews started leaving in 1933, when Hitler took over power, this is one of the reasons why my grandfather would not get his family out. He thought he's a loyal German, he served for Germany, and nothing would happen to him. Yeah. My grandfather was a very successful businessman. He had a manufacturing business that actually used the technology of Henry Ford from the United States to manufacture everything from housewares to hardwares. He exported things all over. He was very successful. He had friends everywhere. His clients loved him. In 1936, three years after Hitler took power, my mom the author of the memoir, was thrown out of the public school because no Jews were allowed to attend the school. Thank okay. you for that, because that fills in the preface of the questions. Your mother was very young. Yes. How, and like you say, your father... My grandfather. Or grandfather, sorry. He was well-loved in the community, and, and he didn't think this would affect him. But when the writing was on the wall, how were your grandmother and your mother able to escape being deported to Dachau or another death camp when this was all going down? So in on November 9th of 1938, that was Kristallnacht. That is when they, you know, even police officers and the public, they were burning down the synagogues, homes, businesses. My grandfather was dragged out of the house the next day, November 10th, he was taken to Dachau. 
my grandmother immediately grabbed my mother and took her to the Catholic Church, the Sisters of St. Joseph, and begged them to hide my mother, which they were amazing. They took in a lot of Jewish children to hide them. Now, many of the parents got exterminated and those kids remained in the Catholic Church. We do not know where my grandmother was at this time. We know where my grandfather was and we know where my mom was. No one spoke about what happened to my grandmother, except as you will see from the memoir, she got out when my grandfather escaped. But we don't know during that period where she was or what happened to her. Obviously, she went into hiding mm -hmm. and succeeded in hiding. At that point, Jews could not get out of Germany. Before that point, in, you know, 36, 37, they were desperately trying to get out. Some, the United States at some point had closed their doors. And so the Jews were going to Argentina and yeah. Israel and many other countries that were still taking them. But they could not get out at that point. They're trying to get out. And so many people saw what was happening. And it was the chipping away at the Jewish rights little by little. And yet everyone was either in denial or thought it wouldn't be that bad. But your grandfather still had the foresight to change his name to protect okay, his family. That, How did that come about? Okay, so it wasn't actually my grandfather that did that. My grandmother's brother, this is a very interesting part of the okay. rescue story. So my grandfather's taken to Dachau. She has a brother that's been in America for 20 years, Julius, and she has a brother, Justin, that's in Luxembourg, had been there for many years. They got out very early. They contacted my grandmother's first cousin. His name originally was Emanuel Rosenfeld, but he changed his name to Max Emanuel. Why did he do that? And how could he get my grandfather out? Let's Go back a little bit to the name Shach. You will recognize the name Shach because he was tried at the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm. Shach was a banker. He worked for the Reich Bank, which was the largest bank in Berlin and in Germany. And this is back in the 20s. And who worked for him? My grandmother's first cousin, Max, well, at the time, Emanuel Rosenfeld, he was a numbers guy. He was a brilliant mathematician. He worked for Schach at the Reich Bank. Now, Hitler comes into power and Schach gets taken by Hitler to be the Minister of Economics and Finance for the Third Reich. And who does Schach bring with him? Max, well, at the time, Emanuel Rosenfeld. That lasted only a year. Why? Because Emanuel Rosenfeld realizes, wait a minute, they're kidnapping Jews. They're burning their homes. He quit the government, but he was smart. He kept his government ID papers that mm -hmm. identified him as a government official for the Third Reich. He kept those papers, but he changed his name to Max Emanuel, and he started the process to get out of Berlin and to get out of Germany. He finally gets his papers to go to America. Now, why was he able to do it? Because of his position. The Americans wanted to know, where's the German money? Who are they banking with? What countries are they, you know, are they sending money to? And Max Emanuel, the former Emanuel Rosenfeld, had this information. So Max Emanuel gets a visa, gets papers to be able to leave Berlin and go to America. He gets a call from his first cousins, Justin and Julius. Adolf, by the way, my grandfather's name was Adolf. Adolf has been taken to Dachau. You have to try to get him out. Can you imagine the decision, the wow. excruciating decision? I can leave Germany right now, or I can risk my life 
drive the 500 kilometers from Berlin to Dachau and try to get my first cousin-in-law out of Dachau. And he made the decision to do it. And that's what the memoir is about. How on earth was he able to do that? And that's what Escape from Dachau, my mom's memoir, is all about. So that is... It's amazing, isn't it? It is amazing because, I mean, it's... How, did he, how did he even do it? I mean, how the risk... Yeah, that, I mean, oh, making yeah. that decision where he could have been safe. Yeah, that is crazy um, and and by the way my and he succeeded right yes he did and i'm going to tell you how but i still hope people will read the details in the book escape from docow but i'll give you a general there were checkpoint after checkpoint after checkpoint but who is guarding the checkpoints at midnight at one in the morning young Nazi soldiers, inexperienced, afraid themselves to do anything wrong or they would be taken in the backyard and shot. Here comes this man driving to the checkpoint, hands out the window an identification packet. They never even opened it to see that his name was a Jewish name. They would see on the outside that he was a government official for the Third Reich let him through, let him through. He got through checkpoint and that experience was terrifying, which is described in the book because some of the checkpoint people were asking him, what is your business here? What are you going through for? And he would say, this is official government business and they would let him through. So that is how he got through all those checkpoints to get to Dachau. And, and by the way, just, you know, not only my grandfather, but his sister didn't leave, went to Auschwitz. She, her husband, and their children were all murdered. So the Jews that were left had very little chance of surviving. If it wasn't for this rescue, I would not be here today. Wow, that's, that's a heavy, heavy load to... Uh... And, and something that you had mentioned, you know, this, the book describes, yes, Dachau was the first concentration camp. And it was, a, it started as a work camp where they made equipment and tanks and planes and, you know, to feed the war machine. But the thing about it is, as my grandfather, well, as my mom described in the book, many innocent Jews died during that period. And in the book, it describes some of the treatment in Dachau. And one of the things I'll never forget is my grandfather saying that th they were taken naked out in the cold, showered with a hose. That was their shower. And many people froze to death and died just from that. So even though early on it was not an extermination camp, they didn't have gas chambers there. They built the gas chambers there, but many people died just being at Dachau and the treatment that they got in Dachau. They were starved. They hardly ate anything. When my grandfather was rescued, uh, his first cousin thought they brought out the wrong man because he was yeah. so emaciated and didn't look like himself. He didn't even recognize him. So where did they go after? So he gets him out of Dachau and they immediately drive to Stuttgart. That is where my mom and my grandmother were. They got my grandmother wherever she was. They went to the Catholic church, the convent, got my mom and headed to Luxembourg where my grandmother's brother was. And they waited there for a year to get their papers. They were able to do it to get out of Luxembourg, especially because my grandmother's brother already lived in America. And they left Luxembourg, went to Antwerp, Belgium, where they caught the, the, the ship to go to America through Ellis Island. Wow. But and it took a year in Luxembourg and that was another thing, that whole experience, because you're anxiously awaiting papers to get out of Europe, basically. Jews were not safe anywhere in Europe at that time. No, and they weren't really welcome even in Canada at that time either. 
Yeah. There were a lot of countries that had closed their doors. Argentina was wonderful. And there were countries that were very welcoming. And that saved a number of people. But as we all know, 6 million perished because yeah. they could not get out. And, you know, pogroms were not new to Nazi Germany. The Russians have practiced genocide against Jewish people long before. But it has to be something every future generation, including yourself, has, you know, without hearing your mother's story, you have this in the back of your history. You have this Absolutely. in the back of your mind. So without even knowing this before this book happened, how did this knowledge impact your life and your mother's life? So that is a wonderful question, Debbie, because to be very honest about it, I really did not. I knew that my family was German and I knew that something happened to them. I had no details. My grandparents and my mom would not speak about it. Starting in the 1960s, the German government set up a program where they paid all expenses for, they called it the, the return of the lost citizens. And they invited from all over the world, Germans that had to leave to come back. My mom refused to do that program. She said, I never want to step foot on German soil again. But in the year 2000, my brother, sister, and I talked her into going back because we thought it would be good closure and it would be healthy for her. So she wrote to the, these, these were all coordinated by the different cities. She got the invitation from the mayor of Stuttgart. She wrote him back and said, I will come. They invited her and another person. I will come if I can bring my daughter and my granddaughter, who was 16 at the time, so that three generations can dance on Hitler's grave, although Hitler wasn't even buried there, but it was a philosophical thing. She said, if I can bring three generations, I will go back. And they said, yes. Now, the reason this is important is my mom still wasn't talking about anything. For this particular visit, there were 20 exiles that came back. And these other people during various programs in high schools and at, at conferences were talking about what happened to them. And all of a sudden, one day in front of my daughter and myself and a crowd of people, my mom started talking about all of this stuff we had never heard before, never heard a word. She comes back to America after the trip. This is the year 2000. And she sits down and she writes her memoir. Wow. She had one request that we do nothing with it until she passed. And I think it's because once she wrote it, she didn't want to talk about it anymore. She yeah. didn't want to think about it anymore. She didn't want to have the discussion that you and I are having right now. So in the year 2021, when my mom passed at 94 years old, we published her memoir. And that's the book, Escape from Dachau. That's how it happened. So it did give her a sense of closure. It did. It did. And we just were so thrilled that we could do this and that we followed my mom's wishes to wait. And what you said is so important. One of the reasons why we did this is because future generations are not being educated about the dark periods in history. And it's very important that we do not forget how humans reacted, what they did, what they did not do, because it's the only way to keep history from repeating itself. And throughout the world now, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. There's a lot of hatred. There's a lot of harassment. And it's very scary for, for Jews today. And, and hopefully the younger generations will not turn into collaborators as did the German public back in the Nazi era. So was your family ever able to save anything from your family home in Germany? Yes, and that is a very interesting story. First of all, when their house was burned down, 
they moved into an apartment building that was mixed. So many of their possessions, a lot of the valuables were taken by the Nazis. They'd go into the Jewish homes and they would steal the, the china, the silver, the jewelry, all of the uh, valuable things they stole. Artwork, as we all know, there's yeah. movies about artwork that was stolen. But my grandfather had a very successful liquor business in Albany, New York. And one of the things that he distributed was different liquors that came from Europe. And he actually was able to connect with one of the distributors that he had a great relationship with. He sold a lot of scotch. Scotch was very popular in America. And he was importing, you know, boxes and boxes. He actually asked, and this is another person that risked their lives. When you go from England and Scotland into Germany, could you make a stop when your truck is empty to this apartment at this address at this number, empty the apartment and bring the possessions to Antwerp, Belgium, which is where, and they did. And wow. this was Dewar's Scotch Company. I, I really want to say that because whoever that driver was, whoever the distributor was, they were willing to do that. And they risked their own lives going yes. into Stuttgart, but they apparently visited different cities in Germany every week because the Germans loved their scotch. Just and that's like probably what saved them. They probably might have been suspicious, but they wanted Ab to keep the supply Absolutely. Going. <laughs> Absolutely. So to answer your question, yes, my brother, sister, and I have inherited a number of small items that belonged to my grandparents, which gives us great pleasure. Hmm. Tell us about your mother. My mom was a wonderful person. She worked in the Dayton, Ohio school system for many years. And the students loved her. The children loved her at her funeral. I even read a letter that came from one of the students at her school. She was an assistant, a secretary at first and then assistant principal that read, it was a gentleman, an African-American gentleman in a suit. He sent his picture along with a letter that said, no words can tell you how much you helped me when I was a child and the encouragement and the self-esteem that you gave me. I will never forget it. And I wanted to write you and let you know I'm a successful businessman with a wonderful family. This never would have happened if it wasn't for you. Wow. My mom was a beautiful person and she worked in a very rough school system in a very rough school district. And she took so many of these kids under her wings and tried to encourage them and let them know they can break free, that they can have great lives and they can succeed. And she was very well known for that. She was a volunteer at the shelter for unmarried pregnant young women. She just did so much for society. She was a wonderful person. How are you like your mom? I hope and pray that I am like my mom. I think the one thing that I am very much like my mom is I have a positive attitude that I really feel like life is beautiful. It Yes, it has its ups and downs, but we are all lucky to be here. We are all lucky to experience life and have opportunities to make choices about our lives. And that was my mom. It's amazing for me to think about her past and what happened to her family. And she was always an optimist and she always looked at the bright side. And she would always, when things were really bad or hard, she'd go, go have a hot fudge sundae because you can't be sad when you're eating a hot food Sunday. And the day of her funeral, we all, she always used to say things like, This too shall pass. You'll wake up tomorrow and this will be over. When you're really feeling down, go have yourself a hot food Sunday. She had a great <laughs> attitude. She was a very positive person. So, given that she and her family had to uproot from their family home, and go through all of that 
what did home mean to your mother? Well, my mom lived in Dayton, Ohio for 65 years. And home to her was where her family, where her children were and where her friends were. She had a lot of friends. So that was home. It wasn't where you were born. It wasn't where you were brought up. It was where you landed. And basically home to her was family and friends. And she had a lot of that. What would you say to those who keep saying the Holocaust was a hoax. I would suggest that they go to the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., where there is a room where many survivors have videotaped for the museum their stories. They are very detailed. They are stories that because of the detail, the dates, the locations, you cannot deny that all of these different people, and including my mom's book, and there are a number of books out there, you cannot deny the detail of what happened. Street names. Uh, I was dragged from this street to where the trains loaded in innocent people up into the train, the cattle cars. It, it You need to just, if you have the nerve, if you want to know the truth, if you're strong enough, you should go to the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and I dare you to leave there feeling the same way you do now. They even have actual cattle cars that people were loaded into in that museum. Wow. So I dare you to visit there and then get back in touch and say, I still feel the same way. Unless you are a heartless person with no soul at all, you will be unable to deny the Holocaust after visiting there. That's what I would say to them. The infection of fascism is worldwide, especially nor in North America, and it's terrifying. Um, I agree. How do we move forward in spite of those who keep embracing authoritarianism and who use these Nazi symbols as badges of honor? I don't have any statistics, but I believe that it's a minority even though it's a very vocal minority. And I think the thing that we need to do as thoughtful, thinking, kind, compassionate people that we are, we need to encourage people that are compassionate to step forward and speak up. If there is a, a Nazi rally in your community, you need to gather together the good people and make sure you show up and you don't even have to speak, just be there and say, we don't want you in our community, get out of our community. We have to make sure that people do not collaborate with these crazy people. But the way to do it is to show up and say no. We don't get out of our community. We don't, you are not welcome here. And that's the way to deal with this minority. Sometimes there are 25, 30 of them with their Confederate flags and their Nazi flags and marching around. They're, they're small numbers. There should be 300 good, compassionate people on the other side of the street, standing there, shaking their finger and saying, you're not welcome here. We don't want you. That's how I feel. And I do that, by the way. I go to, when I hear there's a rally or whatever, I show up. I don't speak. I stand there with a sign, we don't accept you. Go away. So I think that the good people, the compassionate people, the kind people have many opportunities to tell these rotten people to, to go away. And that's how we honor the people who went through these terrible experiences. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. Thank you so much, Susan. It was so wonderful to have you on. 
Thank you so much, Debbie. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And, and let's stay in touch. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.